Welcome everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here together celebrating our last week in February. Um, I have been uh, actually out of the country and I'm so excited to be back home and to see you all. We're gonna open up uh, second service with a few announcements. Hopefully it'll work better than first service. Okay, um, this afternoon, our fellowship, our Cantonese fellowship will be meeting uh, at 2.30 downstairs. It's a wonderful time centered around God's word in the Cantonese dialect. And, and so uh, please join us if you're interested. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to Queenie. Um, starting next month, so March is here already. We're, we're, uh, we're closing out our first quarter of 2023. Our first week of every month, we do a food and fellowship uh, after second service. Please join us, invite your friends. It's a wonderful time where we get to uh, have first and second service folks meet each other, invite your neighbors. Uh, guests are free, uh, but it's, uh, it's a time where we break bread and get to know each other. Uh, following along that, the discipleship uh, fellowship or discipleship uh, uh, training, uh, part two will be commencing at 1230 to 130. Lunch will be uh, complimentary for those attending. Please join us. Also, um, following in March, we have a number of activities throughout March. March 11th on Saturday, there is a fundraising dinner for Alpha Pregnancy Centers, a wonderful ministry that promotes life. Um, if you're interested in attending, please reach out to Pastor Kevin. I believe the church is sponsoring a table uh, where uh, we will be um, supporting that ministry. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to Pastor Kevin. Uh, continuing into March, we have a number of things dedicated for the family. Child dedication service is coming up on March 19th. Uh, if you have a uh, young family, young children, and you want to uh, participate in the dedication service, uh, please sign up here. There's a QR code. Uh, we plan to have a session both in first and second service. A uh, wonderful time for parents to share, uh, commit their children uh, to the Lord. And it's uh, one of the things that we love to do here at FBC. And obviously, it's been uh, a quite a while since we've had a dedication service and Families have been busy having kids, and so uh, we want to set aside that time. Uh, also, the following week, we have our baptismal service. Uh, if you or any of you who are uh, interested in baptism, please reach out to Pastor Kevin. We're pulling that together. We actually want to get a final list two weeks before uh, the 26th. Uh, uh, the team pulls together a number of different um, uh, resources to support the baptismal service, so we want to get an accurate number. So March 26th is our baptismal service. And then uh, our sports ministry is very active and especially as spring rolls around, there's a series of different things that are kicking off. We have a clinic that's geared towards uh, the elementary school age, the uh, primary and juniors, and it's um, several sessions in, uh, in a gym in Hillsboro, um, wonderful gym facilities. We have a uh, uh, session geared towards bringing in kids and families uh, to learn the basics of basketball. Uh, if you are interested, please reach out to uh, our sports ministry. Pastor Kevin obviously knows a lot about that. Um, and it's a session that has a number of activities through the weekends, um, 3 to 4.30, uh, typically on a Saturday. And then uh, we have Crown Basketball starting up as well. Uh, Crown Basketball Ministries is uh, a multi-church ministry. Uh, we will be having signups in the foyer. Uh, we want folks, uh, this is more geared towards uh, the older age, um, youth and adults, and uh, we get teams organized. There's practices, uh, churches play against each other. Great time. Also, please invite guests and visitors. It's an opportunity to share the gospel through basketball. And then uh, the last but not least, we have uh, Easter retreat in April coming up. And so uh, signups will begin in the foyer next week. And so please be prepared, sign up, uh, reserve this time. Wonderful time. We haven't had Easter retreat in several years, obviously. And so I know my family's very excited um, to be uh, attending uh, this this year as well. Last but not least, we want our week, and this week's missionary is, is it not working. We need new batteries. Okay, uh, Pink and Sal oh, wrong way. 
Oh, you see, this is, I'm terrible at this. Okay, I'm gonna leave this up here. And people are gonna, Pink and Selena Davis are our missionaries this week. Um, and they've actually uh, just recently gone back to New Zealand from their uh, long deputation here in the US. A couple of praises for them. One is uh, they have a new house. Uh, the Lord has provided, uh, though it's uh, uh, quite a distance away from uh, their church. Please pray for them in their transition. Continue to pray for Bible Center, uh, which is the church that the Davises serve at in their leading. Pray for the maturity of the flock uh, and then pray for just the ministry development there. Uh, the Davises send much gratitude and uh, thankfulness for the prayer and support that we provide. So please keep them in prayer this week. Uh, it's a wonderful um, partnership that we have with them. Good morning, Fellowship Bible Church. It's good to be home. I was on a plane from McAllen to Dallas yesterday with a pastor of a Methodist church, really committed to the scriptures, and we befriended ourselves going down. He was on a missions trip, and I was at a Bible conference. We got to see each other at the end of the week to see how each other's ministries went. And, and then I said, you got to preach tomorrow? And he said, I get to preach. And I said, oh, amen. <laughs> what a what a thoughtful way to think about that, except, you know, you got to go to Detroit. So I got three more hours than he did. But um, but thank you for your prayers. I spent the last week in the very southern tip of Texas, McAllen, Texas. And um, and I was speaking at a Bible conference down there for uh, a senior citizen. Fairer Park community uh, where it has about 600 folks there. But they, they come down during the winter. They're called snowbirds. And so a lot of them are from Minnesota. Almost every house I went to, they're from Minnesota. They're from Minnesota. You know, and they talk like that. And it's, it's really cute. And they're, they're, they're really such friendly, loving people. I was like, I had three meals a day for seven days with, uh, with groups of four to eight seniors. I mean, and it was, it was wonderful. Tiring. And that was more tiring than preaching, actually. But it was just a delight to, to be with them and to be loved by, like, you have 300 grandparents. Anybody ever have 300 grandparents? And then they're, they're all, all loving you. I lost my voice due to allergies during the week. Monday was, like, really, really bad. It got better each week. But they were giving me emergency Claritin. Um, uh, this this, this uh, cough drop. Somebody gave me Chinese cough drops. I, I use those. But uh, they gave me this fisherman's here or something like that. You know, it was just supposed to be real strong. So they were giving me all kinds of stuff, you know, to, to help my voice. It was nice having three, 400 doting grandparents last week. But it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a unique ministry. They go, the, the main drive, they're a subsidiary of a Bible college in town. This Bible college is called Rio Grande Bible College. And they have about 200 college students that are training and preparing for the ministry. And all of the ministry is all in Spanish. It's wonderful. When I spoke there, I was simultaneously translated. And, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I wasn't pausing for a translator. It's just really neat, the ministry that they do there. But they have hundreds of volunteers who will put in over the winter because they're trying to escape the snow from Wisconsin uh, and Minnesota and South Dakota. And, you know, and they're trying to get in Canada. And so they go south and they serve in the morning at this Bible college. They put in this winter over 25,000 volunteer hours. And the, the average age was 74 of the over 100 volunteers, you know, and they were quilting, they were painting, they were laying cement, you know, and they were doing uh, electro, uh, uh, you know, electrical hookups, you know, they were building homes for the students. Uh, it's it's just a, it's just amazing. So they do that in the day. Then in, they get together for concerts and Bible conferences. They have five Bible conferences uh, a year uh, for a week. And so I've had the privilege of being there for my third time. And uh, you know you just love them. They'll love you. And uh, and so if I give people tips on when you're going to go there, I would tell them just love them, and they're going to love you back. You know because your grandparents. They're, they're Midwestern grandparents that just want to love you. But they're also former pastors, retired missionaries, um, elders and deacons in their 
different churches. And so you have to be sharp. And uh, there, were, there were a group of 18 ladies who says, oh, we have a Bible study where we're studying Jude and we're using K. Arthur's material. And I have great respect for K. Arthur. She's great. You know, and I said, if I get a chance to read K. Arthur, I'll read K. Arthur because she's really, really good. And, uh, and, and, and I, I like the way she thinks about the Bible. And, uh, you know, but I better be sharp. And so, you know, they, they kept on me every, every night. And they just, okay, yeah, we match it up. You know, this was good. And so, ooh. <laughs> and so uh, the, another thing is they're from different denominations. They're Nazarene, C, uh, Christian Missionary Alliance. They were... Uh, um, Baptist, they were fundamental Baptist, independent Bible, um, you know, I mean, they were from all different denominations. And because of that, you know, you only major on the major and you don't minor on the minor. But for them, a lot of it is generational. So, you know, when you go there, I, I have to preach in a tie and a jacket, you know, and so, uh, so you know, I, I, just, I just leave every session, I'm drenched. You know, and and I only have the clothes on for an hour, and then I change back into my old clothes. You know, but it's a, uh, uh, but you know, it's it's that it's it's hymns, right? It's just him only, and uh, you know, they're like when a worship team. You know, that would be not, and it's just generational. And so, so I, you know, so I tell them because we were going through the Book of Jude, where we need to earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, but I said we need to show the younger generation how to fight for the right battles. And we need to have what we call a theological triage, or in other words, it's called picking the right hills to die on. So there's essential doctrines. Those are the ones we would die on. That's, those have to do with salvation, right? Like the deity of Christ, he has to be God. Uh, salvation by faith alone, the Trinity, because the triune God works in our salvation. Justification by faith. Those are, those are, hills that we would die on then there's a second category that we would understand that's biblical but maybe it's not as clear as the doctrine of salvation uh, issues and so like the timing of the rapture or the use of uh, the sign, uh, spiritual gift we don't necessarily have to fight for and then there's things that are opinions like card playing uh you know there's a group that played cards there there's a group that would never play cards there uh and then one fellow approached me after i kind of taught about these kind of columns he says you got it wrong alcohol is a primary doctrine and then i said okay well i'm i i i'm saying okay i don't want to fight them in the lobby here you know and so uh, so uh, you know so you learn how to deflect and i just said oh i'm a cheat totaler too you know, and so, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not a drinker myself, you know, so you, then you just kind of use that to kind of change the topics. I had someone else who went after me, uh, a couple of people actually, because they believe the King James version is the only translation that should be used. And I didn't use the King James version. And so they were correcting me on that. Right. But you got all kinds of people who, who do this. And I'm just trying to say, you know, if we keep setting up our Christianity as, and putting traditions as the essential doctrines, we're just going to scare off that we're not going to teach the new generation how to focus and fight for what really needs to be fought for. And those are essential doctrines. You know, I'm, I'm, I really don't, well, one of the, the pet peeves I have in ministry is when I hear people say, oh, well, FBC believes this, or the pastors believe this, when it's not true. You know, but sometimes these assumptions are made, and it's not even biblical. And, uh, you know, now, if it was biblical, you know, I'm saying, oh, yeah, well, that, I'll own it. But when it's, when I said, I've never said that, and then, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, they, they think that. And so, so that kind of grieves me, because I never want anything that is man-made to get in the way of God's grace. And hold me accountable for that here at Fellowship Bible Church. We don't want to have tradition or history or, you know, FPC has a history of having a lot of rules, you know, back in those days where, where it was how it's going to govern your lifestyle. But if it's not in the scripture, I don't want to be making that a handcuff because that's what religion does. 
religion are man-made ways to try to please God, to try to cleanse our own soul by man's efforts and not the grace of God. So Jesus comes and he, he transforms, he overcomes religion in this section of Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. So let's look at six ways Jesus overcomes religion. The first way he overcomes religion is he overcomes the effects of sin. The effects of sin. While he was in one of the cities, there was a man full of leprosy. Leprosy? Lepers. Jaguars. And, you know, and just... Now, but leprosy, also called Hansen's disease today, it's actually a disease that in 1980 affected 5.2 million people in, around the world. That's a lot of people that have leprosy. It went down by 2020, where there are only 200,000 cases. But it is curable. It is curable by taking a year of these drugs uh, that were made to cure leprosy or Hansen's disease. Here, you would need to take medicine over 12 months. But look what happened. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and he begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Didn't take a year of drugs in today's modern world. Jesus healed him instantly. Now, sickness is a result of sin. When we were originally created, we weren't going to die. We weren't going to get sick. When the part of the judgment in Genesis 3, thorns, thistles, and death, right? Creation was affected, and now man is susceptible to death. We were susceptible to disease. Isaiah used leprosy as an analogy of sin. Also Leviticus. Like leprosy, sin is rooted internally, but has external manifestations. Aren't you glad I didn't use any pictures of leprosy here today? Leprosy separated people. Some people went to leper colonies. And, uh, you know, back in those days, they went to leper co colonies, right? Ben Hur's sisters were in a leper colony. Leprosy spreads like sin. The clothes of the leper were burned, according to Leviticus 13. Leprosy was a stigma, but a stigma like sin can be removed by the grace of God. So sickness, which is an effect of sin, Jesus overcame that as we see him. Now, he didn't want to get a lot of publicity about this. He didn't want any instant Instagram post on this. What he wanted him to do was to go to the priest, show him he'd been cured, and prove to these religious leaders that Jesus has the power over sickness. So he charged him. No, he didn't charge him like with Visa or MasterCard. You know, everything's free with Jesus. But he charged him in the sense of a command to tell no one. And he says, but go show yourself to the priests and make an offering for your cleansing, because that's what Leviticus 14 says to do. Right? Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And he fulfilled it by taking care of the sickness. But he says, I want you to go to the priest, follow the law, be ceremonially clean, as Moses commanded for a proof for them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him, to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to a desolate place and pray. But here we see he went after the effect of sin. And people were saying, wow, what is this going on? First Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. His spiritual effect has cured everything with, between birth and death and everything in between. The second thing we see Jesus overcoming is overcoming obstacles 
to salvation. Overcoming obstacles to salvation. On one of those days, he was teaching. Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. So with this spectacle, there was a report there uh, coming with the Jewish leaders. We better go out there and talk to them. This is the first time we see scribes and Pharisees mentioned in the New Testament. Who are the scribes and Pharisees? Pharisees, the, the word means to separate. During the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, because we read about this in Ezra 9 to 10, 9, chapters 9 and 10, Nehemiah chapters 8 and 9. But here we see that um, Ezra probably set up the Pharisees to help ensure Israel to be separate from the world. So Pharisees, which means to separate, their job was to keep Israel separate from the world. That's why the Mosaic law, the law that was given to Moses, was given so that Israel could be separate from the world. And so the Pharisees would help along that process. But between the time of Ezra and Nehemiah to the time of Jesus, which would be four to 500 years, there was, uh, there was a great degrade among the Pharisees. They started to be less about the book and adding more laws because in our human pride, we start to add things to what God, God already put. So they started making commentaries on the Old Testament, but in their commentaries, they would add different laws. These would end up in what's called the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, and, uh, and where God gave 613 laws in the scriptures, they added thousands more. For example, there would be one command that says, do not, uh, you know, to honor the Sabbath, right? One of the Ten Commandments. But then they came up with like 30 more laws on what they can do on the Sabbath and not do. How many steps you could take on a Sabbath day. What you can carry on a Sabbath day. So when Jesus healed on the Sabbath and a guy's carrying a mat with him, he said, Jesus is breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'm over all of that. I have authority to show mercy while you have no mercy on the people who are being healed and saved today because of your silly little proud laws. That was the Pharisees by the time they got to Jesus. So now he's there with the power to heal, and they're trying to figure out who is this guy. And so, behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But there were so many people around the house and inside the house, they could not get inside. And it's just like, you know, Christmas caroling. And you got so many Christmas carolers and the food's so good inside, nobody else can get in. And so finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they let him down with his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. So here's a little diagram of what uh, a first century house looked like in the time of, uh, of Jesus. And so, you know, we, we would have standard 10, 10 foot ceilings. Theirs would be about seven feet, but they would have ceiling. They would have two stories. They would have a, a roof, which would have some wood or, 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 um, or, or plants on, on top, you know, that, that would, would uh, allow breathing and, and keep the water out. And, uh, but they removed that and they lowered in the bed. This is an amazing group of guys that uh, some modern authors have called stretcher bearers that we would be challenged to have this ministry of seeing who has needs. And a stretcher takes two people to carry. Usually, or you can drag a guy, I guess, with one. But 
but it takes two to four, you know, and we're helping somebody who is in need of Jesus get there, even if it has to be through creative access through the roof. So here is, uh, here are obstacles that the Pharisees are presenting to salvation. They're saying, well, you, you need to follow the laws. You need to become Jewish before you become Christian. You need to do Jewish stuff. And Jesus says, no, it's not about the laws. It's about grace. It's about faith. Even illustrated by the difficulty of getting into the house where they use creative access, notice who Jesus credited with faith. It wasn't the sick, paralyzed guy. It was the stretcher bearers. It was the merciful friends. And he said, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And so he removed the barriers to salvation, which many times people think are works. How good do I have to be to get to heaven? You go to a funeral, people are always thinking, hmm, did they do more good than they did bad so they can get to heaven? Right? How much good do you have to do? When I was in Indonesia and we were walking in a village in Indonesia um, and a missionary was coaching me on how to talk to the villagers and saying, you know, I, I see you're ob observing Ramadan. How do you know you've done enough to please God? Right? And there's that sense, how do I know when I've done enough? That's what religion does. Religion says you have to do this in order to please God or to cleanse yourself. You have to do asceticism of self-denial, uh, you know, or, or you have to do these types of good works. Or, or you've seen people, you know, tell me that when they've been to Jerusalem, they will see people crawling on their hands and knees on the Via Dolorosa, the path that Christ walked, you know, uh, uh, getting bloody and pain so that they can somehow pay in penance for their own sin. They're trying to do it themselves. But those are all obstacles to Christ. The easy access is faith. Illustrated by these guys saying, hey, we want to bring them in. Th their faith gave that man access to salvation. Right? So faith becomes, overcomes that obstacle to salvation. Christ overcame religion by overcoming the obstacle to salvation. Now, similar to that, Christ overcomes religious obstacles to faith because faith has a barrier. Because we say, oh, faith isn't good enough. Because our pride says, oh, we need to do more. It's kind of like fighting for the bill at a, at a restaurant, right? You see your family do that? You know, oh, the, you know, they'll go out there and they'll fight for the bill. And, and, um, and you know, there's an aspect of pride. Well, you know, let me pay a little bit. And that's our pride. Christ overcame that religious aspect of faith. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? So they knew exactly what he was doing. Christ was saving people. He was forgiving sins. And even though you know, we don't see uh, you know, the word salvation being used for the paralytic or for the leper, they were being, they were being saved and forgiven of their sins. And the, the Jewish leaders are recognizing that this is what Jesus is doing. So when Jesus perceived their thoughts, because he knows the heart of all men, he answered them, and he says, why do you question in your hearts? You know, what's inside of you that just cannot accept faith? What is your obstacle to faith? Then he says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? Which one's easier? Well, the first one's easier. But see, the first one, when you say you're forgiven, there's really no verification. Because you might say your sins are forgiven, and then the person goes, oh, you know, my sins are forgiven, but, but how do you really know? So what Jesus does is he goes a step further and gives a physical verification to an internal transformation. He does something on the outside that, that proves something was done on the inside by healing them. So that's why he said, 
That's why it's easy, which is easier. My, my sins are forgiven you or rise and walk. So he says, rise and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has the authority to forgive sins. And so, so here is, uh, did I go too far? Oh, that, yeah, there we are. There, 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 that you know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, go home. And so this is the, the beauty of faith. Uh, that, that, that just trust in Jesus, he'll do the extra mile for you. You don't have to do it. And that's what he's telling the Pharisees. So immediately he rose up before them and he picked up what he had been lying on and he went home, glorifying God. And, amaze, and, and amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things done today. They were probably really glad, too, that there was a hole in the ceiling because it allowed the hot air to go out. But anyway, probably, maybe not. The next thing Jesus does is he overcomes cultural prejudice. He overcomes cultural prejudice. So we go out. And we saw a tax collector named Levi. And guess what he was wearing? I don't know. <laughs> Set you up for that one. All right, so there was a tax collector named Levi. And he was sitting at tax booth. Now, what he would do at the tax booth is when people are moving product and produce, he is at the toll booth saying, what do you got there? Oh, you got this much wheat? You have this much milk? Here's your tax that goes to Rome. All right, so he was a tax collector. Now, Levi would later be named, renamed by Jesus Matthew. Matthew, who would be the writer of the first gospel, which means gift from God. But here he said to Levi, follow me. And immediately he left everything to follow Jesus. He rose and he followed him, and Levi uh, made a great feast in his house to celebrate, I've quit my secular job because I'm now going to be serving Jesus in ministry. So, you know, I mean, tax collectors are pretty rich because they, they added surcharges, you know, to, uh, to what the people were paying to pad their pockets. That's why people didn't really like tax collectors. But here, Levi was throwing a party. Now, it doesn't say that they were doing ne anything necessarily sinful. They just were not liked by the Jewish people because tax collectors were Jewish themselves, collecting from their own people to pay the hated evil empire of Rome. And so there was this cultural prejudice against the tax collectors. But Matthew had them at the party. And they were reclining at a table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They're horrible people. And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of, of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here's this cultural prejudice. I uh, took a tour. My, my son-in-law's grandparents are at Bibleville. I, I met Don and Barbara years ever before I met Jordan. And, uh, you know, and then when, one day, I think my second trip there, I said, oh, I have a daughter who's going to Calvary. And they say, oh, we have a grandson going to Calvary. And we go, wouldn't that be funny if, and the next thing you know, they're getting married right here on stage. And so, But Don and Barbara took me out to the Rio Grande River, and, uh, and we took a boat tour on the river, and we see all these rafts where people would sneak across the border onto the U.S. side. We see the big Trump wall. We see the lower Biden wall. And it just, it's just interesting that there's, I mean, there's all kinds of politics. I try to sense what's the heart of people there. And, um, and, and I learned that 
people who were sneaking the drugs across that they were called mules. And then the people who snuck people across were called coyotes, I think. Right. And so, uh, but, but, you know, and, and so I'm, you know, I'm learning all this stuff and there can, it can be really easy to have this negative attitude towards people who are crossing and crossing illegally. But you know, when I'm talking to the folks at Bibleville, just trying to sense what's their thought and go, you know, that's really, really hard because of course you want things to be done right. But we're also all products of immigrants. And I said, yeah, my dad came to America illegally. He was a paper child, you know, and spent a year on Angel Island when he was eight years old, uh, you know. And, and so, you know, I'm glad for the, the, the opportunities we can have. You know, I mean, it's a difficult thing. But a lot of times people can have their prejudices towards different immigrants, different people, different people who are not like us, tax collectors who tax their own people on the behalf of Rome. And then ask Jesus, why are you sitting with those guys? And Jesus is thinking, well, why aren't you reaching those guys? Why are you helping them understand the law and how Rome fits in with that? You're just sitting there judging them. And Jesus is saying, we're not a country club. We're not a country club where we're going to accept people by how good you're going to make our country club look. We're a hospital. And we're going to treat sick people who know that they need treatment. And there's only one doctor in this health plan, and that's Jesus. And even the PAs, the physician assistants, and the nurses, and the therapists who work in this hospital are also in need of this healthcare system given by the one doctor, Jesus. And Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous because, you know, like, you know, by Bibleville, I, I, I call, uh, it's like CBM camp for senior citizens. I mean, really, they, they have so much fun there. They serve in the morning, they party, they, they study in the evening, and then they party all night, right? You know, and um, except they have all their own, own homes there, so they don't like really sneak out like CBM camp. But anyway, uh, but, but, um, but here, it's, it's not like a, a country club. It's, it's a hospital. And we need to have our sins forgiven. That's why Jesus said, I have come not to the righteous, but to sinners for repentance. So that sinners would repent of their sin and come to faith in Christ. Repentance might be one of those words you feel uncomfortable about. But it's really the flip side of faith. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. Because when you have faith in God, you're turning from the world or yourself to God. When you put faith in Jesus as your Savior, you're, you're turning from trying to save yourself or depending on religion to save you. Then I'm going to give up on man-made religion and trust Christ alone as my Savior. So that's why faith and repentance are, in a sense, synonymous, even though faith might be the positive side of turning to, repentance might be the, the negative side, not negative bad, but just, you know, on the other side of positive, of turning from, turning to, turning from, it happens on the same side of the coin. So that's why he says, I have come call the sinners to repentance. Christ also overcomes Religious duty, religious duty. So the Pharisees, you know, I mean, they they like their religion and they like their practice. And he says, hey, haven't you watched us? And the disciples of John, they are fasting often and they offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But your disciples, they eat and drink. What is it? I mean, what about these these rules of, of religious duty. Now, fasting is a good thing to do, but it's not commanded in the New Testament. It's practiced in the New Testament, and, but it's not commanded in the New Testament. Matthew 6 assumes that there are some who are fasting, but he says, when you fast, the early church did practice fasting, as we see in Acts 13 and 14, 
but it's not commanded as a practice. It's a good thing if you do it, but you shouldn't be feeling guilty if you don't. Jesus says, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. And he's saying, I'm here. We should be celebrating. Weddings in New Testament times, the celebration was a week long. They partied for a week. Like I partied for a week last week. You know, with the 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds. You know, then they they... They know that they know how to eat. Uh, you know, I mean, I have three meals a day. A senior, can you imagine saying, "Oh no, I'm on a fast this week. I'm not going to Texas and saying I'm fast." Now, what Jesus is saying is, while the bridegroom is here, we celebrate. This is a time of joy. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken from them. Now, now that's a, a subtle reference to a time when he will be crucified. And then they will fast in those days. We celebrate the arrival of the king. We throw joy towards him and from him. And so religious duty is such joy in Christ's presence. Last overcoming religion that we see here is Christ overcoming religious traditions. Just traditions. And Jesus uses a couple of parables here. And the first is a parable of the patch. Now, please understand, this is before jeans with holes in them and off-color patches became fashionable. Jesus tells them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Because if he does, and he goes through the hot wash and the hot dry cycle, he will tear the new. And the piece from the new will never, will not match the old. All right, so if you take a new, an old garment and you patch it with a new garment, it's going to be a mismatch. Now, what the Pharisees were looking for was seeing how Jesus can patch their software of old Judaism. They didn't look for an overhaul. They just wanted a software patch. And Jesus said, this patch will not match your old religion. This patch, well, you, don't, you don't need a patch. You need an overhaul. And yet we have people who like to patchwork their religion. They like to go, a little bit of this. A little bit of that, right? From you know that song from uh, um, Fiddler, right? But a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that religion. What a joy to you know, Ron is as accepting Christ. She, I believe, in all religions for all these years, and and Christ by by not taking the Christ alone. Not a patch here, a non patch here. When I was at Bibleville, some of the ladies would volunteer as seamstresses and they're making uh, uh, curtains. And I also saw they had a quilt table where they're making some really beautiful quilts, you know. But that's where they take a little patch here, a little patch there. Jesus comes with a whole garment of salvation. Isaiah 61 10 says, For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. We get a whole robe, not a patch, not a patch to the system. So also in illustrating, he overcomes those religious tradition of the old religion. He uses another illustration of wineskins, of wineskins. Nobody puts new wine into old wineskins. Why? New wine is in the process of fermenting. Fermenting puts out gas. If you put new wine into new wineskins, there's flexibility. Now, the skins would be skins of animals. They would take, clean it up, sew it together, put in the wine, and then there was flexibility in new wineskins for it to expand because of the gases. 
but you would not put new wine in old wine skin. Why? It's already been stretched out and it's brittle and it would explode. My grandfather, uh, and Mitch's grandfather too, because we're brothers, but Mitch, my grandpa, uh, my mom's dad, was a zookeeper at the San Francisco Zoo. Every weekend we went out to the zoo and it was so fun. We would get those pink brick popcorn that I can't find anymore, but oh man, those used to be so good. I ate those every week. You know, my dad, my grandfather, he's feeding Tinkerbell the elephant. For those of you who remember when San Francisco Zoo had elephants, you know, and he even got pushed into the water by a, an angry hippo. And, um, you know, and he was never the same after. That was a that was pretty rough patch. But, um, but because he worked at the zoo, he was able to get this ostrich egg. So he gave me this ostrich egg. It was really cool. It's like this big. So I put it in my room, but he never told me what to do with it. About a month later, I hear this bang. And then I smell the smell. And then I walked up into my room and it was like all colored with yellow sulfur. Everything. Oh, it was, it was horrible. Mommy, here, you remember that? And, and so, so it was, uh, no, not you, sorry. Uh, but, but it's, uh, uh, you know, but it was it, it, because of the gas, it just exploded. And that's what would happen if you put new wine in old wine skins. So that's why he says, if he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and your skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. So he's saying, Pharisees, you don't need to put this new religion and try to fit it in your old wine skins. You need new wine skins. Jesus is the new covenant who came to take away the old covenant of the law. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And as the new covenant promised in the Old Testament, it would be everything that Jesus did for us because religion could not do it for man. That's the new covenant. Hebrews 8.13 says, and speaking of a new covenant, he made the first one obsolete. It was an old wineskin. It was an old garment. He took that old covenant away. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You know, gone is the, the system of Moses. Now is the grace of Christ. Before was that of religion versus the grace and access of our Lord Jesus. So what we have to understand is that man-made religion is a barrier to a saving relationship with Christ because it focuses on what man should do instead of what Christ has done. So religion that's saying, oh, well, well, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe that I have to do this, 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 and that. I have to have perfect attendance, and if I don't, then I have to go visit a priest in a booth, and then if not, you know, then I have to pay time off in purgatory, right? and it's all about what they are adding to what Jesus has done. Religion is a barrier to a relationship with Christ because it is about what man should do instead of what Christ has done. And I'm asking you today, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, forsake religion, even Christian aspects that has put man-made works as an interference to the wonderful grace where Jesus did everything for us. Legalism, which is the imposition of man's laws to make man look more holy and righteous than somebody else, which is the, the pride of the Pharisees, the external, the, the externalism of the Pharisees who just worked on the outside but didn't work on the inside of the heart. Legalism sets up man-made laws or rules that are contrary to God's grace, which contrasts man's efforts instead of God's gift of salvation. What man does versus what Jesus is gifting us. Trust Christ as your Savior and receive the gift of salvation because he died on the cross for us. And last, Christianity is absolutely different than any other religion. 
Religion is man trying to say, how can I work my way up to God? Biblical Christianity is God reaching down to man to pick us up because we can't climb. We can't climb our way to God. It's too high. It's too far. And we're too sinful. He came down and he did all the work for us. At Oxford University, there was a discussion one evening about all the merits of different religions and how Christianity was different. C.S. Lewis, a strong defender of Christianity, comes in late, sits down in this debate, asks what the rumpus is all about. And he learns that it's about the uniqueness of Christianity to which he immediately and simply commented, oh, that's easy. It's grace. That's the difference between religion and Christ and a relationship with Christ, which is offered to us free. That's grace. All we need to do is receive it, not religion where you have to work for it. Christ overcame religion. Our prayers is Heavenly Father, thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that he transformed religion, even the Jewish religion that he was a part of, pointing out that it is not man's effort, but it is Christ's work, that it is not by us following or keeping the law, but it is by Christ fulfilling the law. And as he fulfilled the law, he was the worthy one to die as the sacrifice for our sins. Father, thank you that in his death and resurrection, he demonstrated that he can defeat death and sin and everything that plagues us from birth to life to death. Thank you for the access that we have to Christ through faith and grace alone, not of man's works, lest we boast about it. And it's because of Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you and enjoy the grace of God today.